on Homeland Security will come to order. Without objection, the chair may declare the committee in recess at any point. Without objection, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Kamick, is permitted to sit on the dais and ask questions to the witness. The purpose of this hearing is to receive testimony on the full scale, scope, and pace of threats posed to the homeland. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. 22 years have passed since September the 11th. Since then, the nature of the threats we face has evolved, and the security, challenge, security challenges are becoming more dynamic each day. I don't say this lightly. This is one of the most dangerous times in the history of the United States. Some of the greatest threats include an open and lawless southwest border. Ask any border sheriff, or for that matter, the mayor of New York City, the rising threat of terrorism, rogue nation state actors and criminal elements seeking to do us harm, and efforts by foreign adversaries like the Chinese Communist Party to target our critical infrastructure. Of course, we also have the wars in Israel and Ukraine and rising Chinese aggression in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. To overcome these significant challenges, we must take a clear-eyed and holistic look at these threats. First, we're facing an unprecedented crisis at our southwest border. In just three years, the administration has systematically dismantled our nation's border security and created the worst border crisis in American history. While my friends on the left defend these actions, though now maybe less so than they did at the start, it is clear that this crisis is not the result of budget cuts, changes in border patrol resources, or changes in the immigration laws passed by Congress. What has changed was the cancellation of effective policies that had secured our borders. The Biden administration ended proven policies like remain in Mexico, asylum cooperative agreements, and construction of new border wall systems. As a result, people tested the system, were released into the country, called home, and millions more came. A lot like a college town bar that doesn't card. Before long, they have a line out the door. Worse, as acknowledged by A.G. Garland, uh, Attorney General Garland, the drug cartels have taken advantage of this policy shift and executed a strategy pushing mass waves of people to tie up Border Patrol and then bypass them with thousands of pounds of fentanyl, killing Americans at an unprecedented rate. Worse, as acknowledged by A.G. General, uh, Attorney General Garland, the drug cartels have taken advantage of this policy shift and executed a strategy that is tying basically resulting in mass human trafficking. Under Secretary Mayorkas, we just saw a record-breaking year for illegal immigration. CBP reported 2.47 million alien encounters along the southwest border in fiscal year 2023. Since taking office, Secretary Mayorkas has overseen more than 6.5 million southwest border encounters, 7.8 million nationwide encounters, and more than 1.8 million known gotaways. All records. To put this into perspective, the number of illegal immigrants who've entered our country since President Biden took office is greater than the population of 33 of our nation's states. I'll repeat that, more than 33 out of our 50 states. Furthermore, under Secretary Mayorkas, violent Mexican cartels are making record profits. In fact, the New York Times reported that cartels earned around 500 million a year in 2018 on human smuggling, Today, they earn an estimated 13 billion. The failure of this administration's border policies has created a humanitarian and national security crisis as transnational criminal organizations prey on vulnerable migrants and sneak across violent felons and individuals on the terrorist watch list. And yet, Secretary Mayorkas has continued to mislead Congress and the American people, claiming that this is what a secure border looks like. Second, Malicious activity by nation state actors and terrorism poses a direct threat to the United States homeland. Without question, the homeland is less safe under this president. The catastrophic Afghanistan withdrawal two years ago signaled weakness and a lack of leadership to the world. Our nation's adversaries have been emboldened to attack our allies and our friends and are undermining our security here at home. Significant threats to our cities and our local communities are only growing. As each of you recently, 
testified before the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, foreign terrorist organizations, including those supported by Tehran, have gained a sense of momentum following Hamas's brutal terrorist attack against Israel last month. These terrorist organizations continue to call for attacks against the U.S. at home and abroad. This includes al-Qaeda, which, as Director Ray has pointed out, has issued its most specific call to attack the U.S. in the last five years. As our adversaries seek to further destabilize the Middle East, we must confront how these threats directly impact our own homeland security. According to DHS, 294 aliens whose name appear on the terrorist watch list were stopped trying to cross our southwest border between ports of entry since FY 2021. Compare that with 11 individuals stopped in the four years before FY 2017 through 2020. Think about that for a moment. It's intuitive. Why would these individuals, who under the previous president only had 11 attempts to cross and were caught, suddenly feel like they could try and succeed? Policy changes. In the last two years, CBP encountered over 6,000 special interest aliens in, from Afghanistan, 1,600 from Pakistan, 659 from Iran, and 123 from Iraq between ports of entry. Additionally, DHS documents obtained by this committee show that more than 20,000 Russians, nearly 230 Afghans, and more than 1,800 Uzbeks have been released into the country via the misguided CBP-1 app, mass parole program, with minimal or no vetting. And these are just the ones we know about. How many other individuals posing a national security threat have been among the 1.8 million known gotaways? No one knows. And that is terrifying. Our committee has been engaged with DHS, the FBI, NCTC, to ensure resources are appropriately allocated to counter these threats from terrorism. That said, more must be done. We, we are still waiting on sufficient information on the Biden administration's handling of the heightened national security risks posed by a massive number of aliens with terrorist ties illegally crossing the southwest border. We will not be deterred. We demand DHS's full compliance and without delay. Compliance that I might add is dictated by the Constitution. Third, anti-Semitism is rising and threats against communities of faith in the United States are reaching historic levels. Anti-Semitic attacks have risen sharply in the United States since October 7th. Foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS have called on its extremist supporters to target Jewish communities in the United States and Europe. The free world pledged never again nearly 80 years ago. Now it's time we stand firm and united against this evil. We must not let these anti-Semitic attacks and the increasingly hateful rhetoric become a harbinger of something worse to come. We must do all we can to protect houses of worship and vulnerable communities from such targeted violence. Fourth, cyber attacks continue to undermine our homeland security. The cyber threats we face from malicious nation states and cyber criminals are increasingly complex. This summer, the federal government experienced multiple incidences, including right before the Secretary of Commerce's visit to, to China. Our critical infrastructure is also under attack. This year's annual threat assessment of the United States intelligence community highlighted the threat that adversarial cyber actors pose to our critical infrastructure owners and operators. DHS, CISA, and the FBI have a crucial role to play in supporting these owners and operators to defend against and respond to these threats. Finally, we must address the challenge posed by the CCP. Against the backdrop of all these threats lie the specter of a regime that continues to challenge the United States economically, technologically, diplomatically, and militarily. Through its relentless espionage, the CCP is stealing U.S. intellectual property, trade secrets, and other sensitive data of Americans and American companies. Over the past year alone, the CCP has increased its espionage efforts against the homeland in a variety of ways. These include the CCP's surveillance balloon, collecting intelligence on sensitive sites, and Chinese nationals posing as tourists to access our military installations and other sensitive sites. And Chinese nationals who have crossed our southern border at unprecedented levels. 24,000 apprehensions of Chinese nationals at the southwest border in FY 2023 alone, 
a 1,100% increase from last year. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see there's intentionality there. If recent reports are correct, the CCP also operates dozens of overseas police stations, which aid their transnational repression effort by intimidating and threatening Chinese dissidents abroad. DHS and the FBI must ensure that transnational repression tactics and schemes by foreign governments cannot continue on American soil, and we stand ready to help. The CCP has also made strides in infiltrating our nation's education system. It should concern every American that billions of dollars from the CCP are flowing into our K-12 classrooms and institutions of higher education. This is a systematic effort by the CCP to expand its influence within America's classrooms and promote its authoritarian and anti-American agenda. So what is the Homeland Security Committee doing about these threats? Well, first in May, we passed H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act, the most comprehensive border security legislation in decades. We have addressed cyber threats head on through a whole of nation approach. We've passed legislation encountering responsible use, encouraging responsible use of open source software in the federal government and building DHS's cyber workforce. I've convened a group of committees across Congress to discuss and develop solutions to this problem that implicate multiple committees of jurisdiction. Just last week, this committee advanced Congressman Pfluger's legislation to prohibit D DHS funds from flowing into universities that host Confucius Institutes and Chinese entities of concern. Further, we passed Congressman Guest's common sense legislation to counter the CCP's brazen espionage and theft of U.S. innovation by barring DHS from purchasing drones from the PRC or other foreign adversaries. We have held multiple hearings to examine the evolving threat of terrorism more than two decades after September the 11th and their implications on the homeland including a recent hearing where we received confirmation of the immediate and significant threat the Iranian regime poses to the United States homeland. This committee has also deemed demanded information on individuals from Uzbekistan and other countries who used a smuggler with ties to ISIS to enter the United States through our southwest border. We also demanded information on DHS's screening and vetting of Afghan evacuees in the wake of our catastrophic withdrawal most recently, we've requested documents and information from both DHS and the FBI on terrorist threats at the southwest border. The department and FBI's delays and lack of responsiveness have become an unacceptable pattern. Make no mistake, we will continue to use every tool at our disposal to secure these answers for the American people. I look forward to a productive conversation about the current threats to our homeland and the actions being taken to prevent them. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning and welcome to our witnesses, Secretary Mayorkas, Director Ray, and Director Abizade. Uh, we welcome you. With one notable exception, during the prior administration, you and your predecessors have regularly come before this committee to discuss security threats facing the homeland and how your department and agencies are keeping our country safe. Thank you for being here today and for your service. And please convey our thanks to the dedicated public servants who work for you and for all of us every day. This worldwide threats hearing takes place with a war going on in the Middle East, persistent threats from foreign terrorist organization, and domestic violent extremists and surging anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We are seeing more sophisticated cyber attacks, unprecedented global migration, and have a presidential election less than a year away. The list of issues critical to the homeland goes on. My Democratic colleagues and I plan to ask you about these issues, and we stand ready and willing, as always, to work with you to address these challenges on behalf of the American people. Unfortunately, my Republican colleagues have a different agenda today, and we need to be clear about what their agenda really means from the outset of this hearing. Republicans are directly politically motivated attacks at administration witnesses, and they are doing so to distract from Republicans' own failures at governing. They are infighting, and their support for a Republican presidential candidate who is himself 
a threat to democracy. That's what some people in Washington do rather than take responsibility for their own failures. And to be sure, Republicans have failed at running the House of Representatives. They ousted their own speaker, paralyzing the House and bringing the legislative process to a standstill for weeks as they fought among themselves. They can't manage to pass bills to fund the government. Instead, they have abruptly pulled spending bills from the House floor and have gone from near shutdown to near shutdown despite the harm it caused to our government, our economy, and our security. They appear on TV to rant about border security, and they issue bogus so-called reports replete with false statements and racist rhetoric about the border. Other complain about bookstores refusing to sell their propaganda. But when it comes to actually paying for border security personnel and resources or passing legitimate border security legislation, they are AWOL. They talk tough about strengthening our cyber defenses, but then vote to slash funding for the agency charged with that important mission. They reveal their presidential candidate who admires dictators and despots, calling them capable, competent, and smart, who recently refer referred to his political opponents as vermin and threatened to use the Justice Department against them. Who talks about erecting, quote, detention camps, unquote, on United States soil? Republicans don't want to own up to it or deal with any of that. So rather than getting their own house in order, they direct baseless attacks at the administration and Secretary Mayorkas in particular. We know their extreme mega members are desperate to impeach someone, anyone at all. They are on a crusade to impeach the secretary, although there's zero justification for it. Unlike the Trump administration, the Biden administration has followed the law on border security and immigration. Claiming asylum at the border is lawful. If my Republican colleagues don't like the law, well, they're in the majority. Try to change it. The prior administration also refused to provide information sought by Congress in more than 100 congressional inquiries. But this administration has been and continues to be responsive to Congress. It is my understanding today's hearing is Secretary Mayorkas' 27th time testifying before Congress is being confirmed as Secretary. Under his leadership, DHS has responded to more than 1,400 congressional letters and produced more than 11,000 pages of documents to this committee alone. Secretary Mayorkas is carrying out his responsibilities as Secretary of Homeland Security, but Republicans don't like this administration's policies. Cabinet secretaries shouldn't be impeached over policy differences. That's not what the Constitution says. That's not what the founders intended. They certainly shouldn't be impeached to distract from Republican failures or to appease the extreme mega element that has overtaken their party. Rather than this impeachment distraction, we should be focused on how Congress and administration can work together to secure the homeland. That's what this committee has done since its inception. That's what we were sent here to do. And that's what the American people expect of us. It's a shame my Republican colleagues are working their own agenda. Instead, because of this committee and this Congress and our homeland suffers because of it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. And I'm pleased to have an important uh, panel of witnesses before us today, and I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may be seated. I would now like to formally introduce our witnesses. The Honorable Alejandro Mayorkas was sworn in as Secretary of Department of Homeland Security by President Biden on February the 2nd of 2021. Mr. Mayorkas has had a 30-year career 
as a law enforcement official and a lawyer in private sector. From 2013 to 2016, he served as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and as the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services from 2009 to 2013. The Honorable Christopher Wray became the eighth director of the FBI. On August 2, 2017, Mr. Wray started his law enforcement career in 1997, serving in the Department of Justice as an Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. The Honorable Christine Abizade was sworn in as the Director of National Counterterrorism Center on June 29th of 2021. She is the eighth Senate confirmed director and the first woman to lead the United States counterterrorism enterprise. Previously, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. I thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I now recognize Secretary Mayorkas for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, distinguished members of this committee. In September, the Department of Homeland Security published the 2024 Homeland Threat Assessment, laying out the most direct, pressing threats to our security. Already, in the weeks since the assessment was published, the world has changed. Hamas terrorists horrifically attacked thousands of innocent men, women, and children in Israel on October 7, brutally murdering wounding, and taking hostages of all ages. In the days and weeks since, we have responded to an increase in threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab American communities and institutions across our country. Hate directed at Jewish students, communities, and institutions add to a pre-existing increase in the level of anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world. As the last month has shown, the threat environment our department is charged with confronting has evolved and expanded constantly in the 20 years since our founding after 9-11. Today, individuals radicalized to violence can terrorize using a vehicle or a firearm. A transnational criminal organization needs only to conceal 2.2 pounds of fentanyl in a commercial truck or passenger car crossing through our land port of entry to kill as many as half a million people. Lone actors in nation states such as Russia, Iran, North Korea, and the People's Republic of China can use computer code to steal sensitive personal information, shut down critical infrastructure, and extort millions in ransom payments. Compromising deepfake images can exploit and ruin the life of a young person. Extreme heat, wildfires, and devastating hurricanes are increasing in frequency and severity and our department's founding rationale, the threat posed by foreign terrorists using weapons of mass destruction remains. The 260,000 men and women of the Department of Homeland Security work every day to mitigate these threats and many more. I am immensely proud to be here today on their behalf to discuss the work they do, the challenges they face, and most importantly, the support they require from Congress to do their jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. I would like to focus today on two such means of critical, urgent support. First, Congress must now not allow key DHS authorities to lapse. Our department's authority to implement the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards expired on Jan July 28th. That means the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is barred from inspecting over 3,000 high-risk chemical facilities, including one in Shepherd, Texas, where an explosion last week forced nearby communities to shelter in place for hours. We are also barred from identifying who is accessing them and whether they are stockpiling dangerous chemicals. Historically, more than a third of inspections identify at least one gap in a facility's security. Our counter drone authority will expire on Saturday, challenging among other missions, the Secret Service's ability to protect the president and vice president and Customs and Border Protection's ability to patrol the southwest border and intercept cartel drones ferrying drugs and other contraband through the air. Our weapons, our department's Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Authority will expire on December 21. That would hinder our ability to detect biological and illicit nuclear material threats and safeguard against the use of AI in the development of biological weapons as President Biden charged us with doing last month in his executive order on artificial intelligence. 
Finally, key elements of our intelligence collection authority under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act will expire on December 31. Expiration would leave our country vulnerable to attacks supported by American citizens, and it would cripple our ability to identify and secure American citizens who are the targets of such attacks. Renewing each of these four authorities is common sense, bipartisan, and critical to our national security. This is not a moment to let our guard down. Second, we need Congress to allocate sufficient resources to enable our nation's frontline officers to carry out their difficult jobs and keep the American people safe. Last month, our administration requested critical supplemental Homeland Security funding that would help us do just that. This funding package would allow us to more effectively combat the scourge of fentanyl, stem the impacts of historic migration, and accelerate work authorization for eligible non-citizens. This funding will, in short, make a critical difference in our department's operational capacity and in our national security. Ensuring the safety of the American people is a national imperative and a governmental obligation. I look forward to partnering with Congress to deliver for the men and women who keep our country safe. I look forward to working with you to address the threats and challenges America faces today and in the years to come. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. I now recognize Director Ray for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee. It's been more than five weeks since Hamas terrorists carried out their brutal attacks against innocent Israelis, dozens of American citizens, and others from around the world. And our collective efforts remain on supporting our partners overseas and seeking the safe return of the hostages. But this hearing, well, focused on threats to our homeland, is well-timed given the dangerous implications the fluid situation in the Middle East has for our homeland security. In a year where the terrorism threat was already elevated, the ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole nother level. Since October 7th, we've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations call for attacks against Americans and our allies. Hezbollah expressed its support and praise for Hamas and threatened to attack U.S. interests in the Middle East. Al-Qaeda issued its most specific call to attack the United States in the past five years. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula called on jihadists to attack Americans and Jewish people everywhere. ISIS urged its followers to target Jewish communities in the United States and Europe. Given those calls for action, our most immediate concern is that individuals or small groups will draw twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East to carry out attacks here at home. That includes homegrown violent extremists inspired by a foreign terrorist organization and domestic violent extremists targeting Jewish Americans or other faith communities like Muslim Americans. Across the country, the FBI has been aggressively countering violence by extremists citing the ongoing conflict as inspiration. In Houston, we arrested a guy who'd been studying bomb making and posted about killing Jewish people. Outside Chicago, we've got a federal hate crime investigation into the killing of a six-year-old Muslim boy. At Cornell University, we arrested a man who threatened to kill members of that university's Jewish community. And in Los Angeles, we arrested a man for threatening the CEO and other members of the Anti-Defamation League. And I could go on. On top of the so-called lone actor threat, we cannot and do not discount the possibility that Hamas or another foreign terrorist organization may exploit the current conflict to conduct attacks here on our own soil. We have kept our sights on Hamas and have multiple investigations into individuals affiliated with that foreign terrorist organization. And while historically our Hamas cases have identified individuals here who are facilitating and financing terrorism overseas, we continue to scrutinize our intelligence to assess how that threat may be evolving. But it's not just Hamas. As I highlighted for this committee in my testimony last year, Iran, the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism, has directly or by hiring criminals 
mounted assassination attempts against dissidents and high-ranking current and former U.S. officials, including right here on American soil. Or take Hezbollah, Iran's primary strategic partner, which has a history of raising money and seeking to obtain weapons here in the United States. FBI arrests in recent years also indicate that Hezbollah has tried to seed operatives, establish infrastructure, and engage in spying here domestically, raising our concern that they may be contingency planning for future operations in the United States. And while we are not currently tracking a specific plot, given that disturbing history, we are keeping a close eye on what impact recent events may have on those terrorist groups' intentions here in the United States and how those intentions might evolve. Now, I want to be clear. While this is certainly a time for heightened vigilance, it is by no means a time for panic. Americans should continue to be alert and careful, but they shouldn't stop going about their daily lives. All across the country, the FBI's men and women are working with urgency and purpose to confront the elevated threat. That means working closely with our federal, state, and local partners on our FBI-led Joint Terrorism Task Forces, taking an even closer look at existing investigations and canvassing sources to increase awareness across the board, and doing all we can working with our partners to protect houses of worship here in the U.S. Bottom line, we're going to continue to do everything in our power to protect the American people and support our partners in Israel. Now, protecting Americans from the threat of terrorism is and remains our number one priority. But as you all know, the range of threats that we battle each and every day is enormous, from cyber attacks, to economic espionage, to violent crime and narcotics trafficking and everything in between, the problems we tackle aren't getting any easier. But we have continued to work to outpace our adversaries. We disrupted over 40% more cyber operations last year and arrested over 60% more cyber criminals than the year before. We've got easily 2,000 active investigations across all 56 field offices into China's relentless efforts to steal our innovation and intellectual property. And over the past two years alone, we've seized enough fentanyl to kill 270 million Americans. That's more than 80% of all Americans. Just this month, working with our partners, FBI Boston seized nearly 8 million doses of fentanyl and methamphetamine-laced pills and powder, including nearly 20 pounds of fentanyl-laced pills that had been pressed to look like heart-shaped candy. That's one of the largest single seizures in New England history and demonstrates the deadly reach of the cartels trafficking dangerous drugs to every corner of our nation. I am incredibly proud of the 38,000 skilled and dedicated professionals of the FBI who tackle all these complex challenges. And I think it is our shared responsibility to make sure that they've got the tools they need to keep all of us safe. Indispensable in that toolkit against foreign adversaries are the FBI's FISA 702 authorities. And I'm happy to talk about all the things the FBI has done over the past couple of years to make sure we're good stewards of our 702 authorities. But I can tell you it would be absolutely devastating if the next time an adversary like Iran or China launches a major cyber attack, we don't see it coming because 702 was allowed to lapse. Or, or with the fast-moving situation in the Middle East, just imagine if some foreign terrorist organization overseas shifts its intentions and directs an operative here who'd been contingency planning to carry out an attack in our own backyard. And imagine if we're not able to disrupt that threat because the FBI's 702 authorities have been so watered down. I want to close by thanking you for your continued support of the FBI's men and women who work tirelessly and selflessly to protect all Americans. And thank you for having me here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Director Ray. I now recognize Director Abizade for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. 
This hearing is especially timely as we continue to monitor the response of global terrorist actors in the wake of Hamas's tragic and brutal 7 October terrorist attack. The attack affected Americans directly, including over 32 who were killed and those who were taken hostage. While Hamas itself continues to focus its operational activity in the immediate region, Hamas's attack and the conflict that it has precipitated has reverberated across the globe among an ideologically diverse array of threat actors. Whether it be members of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, individuals inspired, including those motivated by a racial or ethnic animus, or groups considered to be a part of the Iranian-aligned axis of resistance, terrorists and violent extremists are exploiting multiple core grievances to fuel violence. Among these grievances, are the renewed salience of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the already heightened atmosphere of anti-Semitism globally, and narratives that call for violence as a result, and a refocused attention on US military involvement in the region and our relationship with Israel. All of these are amplified by graphic images and emotive content shared over social media in a way intended to drive groups and individuals to political violence. Here in the United States homeland, our current heightened threat posture is driven primarily by our concern that individuals may increasingly mobilize for attacks, particularly against Jewish, Arab, and Muslim communities. This is consistent with our years-long assessment that those inspired to terrorism, rather than those directly linked to hierarchical organizations, are the most likely to carry out a successful attack on US soil. Outside of the United States, we are monitoring the activities of foreign-based groups, particularly ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which view the US as their primary enemy and have publicly called for attacks in the wake of October 7th. Their ability to orchestrate attacks from their core operating arenas has been diminished by years of counterterrorism pressure, but while these groups have disaggregated and become more focused in their local regions in recent years, they have a presence across a wide swath of territory from West Africa to South Asia, and we are on the lookout for any attempts by their members to leverage this crisis to rebuild and refocus against the United States. Iran and its proxies, including Lebanese Hezbollah, Iraqi Shia militants, they are a major concern, principally for their ability to generate attacks in the Middle East, including those that have significant escalatory consequences. While we have no intelligence to indicate Iran or its proxies had foreknowledge of Hamas's October 7 attack, we remain focused on Iranian and Iranian-linked activity in support of Hamas and directed against US interests since the outbreak of the conflict. Thus far, Iranian-aligned militant groups have conducted over 50 attacks against US forces in Iraq and Syria using rockets and unmanned aerial systems. This is in addition to several instances of Israel-focused attacks uh, missiles and UAS attacks by the Yemen-based Houthis and the daily paramilitary attacks on Israel by Hezbollah, which also happens to be a globally capable terrorist organization. Even as the United States comes up under attack, we assess Iran and Hezbollah are trying to walk a very fine line in the region, avoiding overt actions that risk opening them up to a more direct conflict with Israel or the United States, while still exacting costs by enabling anti-US and anti-Israel attacks. Iran's current regional activities come on top of an already aggressive global posture over the last several years, including attempted attacks in the United States aimed at Iranian dissidents or in retaliation against former US government officials that it deems responsible for the 2020 death of Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani. It is clear that even in today's heightened threat environment, significant CT pressure brought to bear against terrorist groups over the last two decades, along with investments in ineffective CT defenses here at home, has resulted in an overall diminished directed terrorist threat to the United States homeland. However, as evidenced by the events of the past six weeks, the threat landscape is highly dynamic. Our country must preserve its CT fundamentals to ensure constant vigilance. Among these fundamentals is the intelligence collection 
enabled by Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which provides key indications and warning on terrorist plans and intentions and supports international terrorist disruptions. I respectfully urge Congress to reauthorize this vital authority, not only for its CT benefits, but for the benefits it brings across a range of national security challenges. At the National Counterterrorism Center, we are part of a whole of government CT architecture that is foundational to our national security. And though built with 9-11 as its backdrop, this architecture has proven adaptive to today's environment and capable of addressing an inherently unpredictable range of terrorist adversaries. For those who serve as part of this CT community, I would like to end with a thank you. Your years of dedication to the CT mission has done so much to protect this country from terrorism. The United States has relied upon you time and again, and today is no exception. With that, I welcome your questions. Thank you, uh, Director Abizade. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all the members have been recognized. Um, I want to also acknowledge the many members on this committee on both sides of the aisle who have been fighting the terrorist attack and their service in the United States military. So those who are veterans here have been doing that and those in the government service doing that before you came to Congress, thank you for your service. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Director Ray, um, since January of 2021, Approximately 1.8 million illegal alien gotaways have evaded Border Patrol and entered our country. And this doesn't even account for the unknown gotaways, which former Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortez testified before this committee could be about 20% of that number, meaning the real number of gotaways is well over 2 million. Can the FBI guarantee the American people that known or suspected terrorists, including any from Hamas or other terror groups, are not amongst those gotaways? Well, certainly the, the group of people that you're talking about are a source of, of great concern for us. That's why we're aggressively using all 56 of our joint terrorism task forces. And there, but there's really no way for you to guarantee that Hamas isn't in those. Well, I, again, the, as you say, there's the unknown unknown and the known unknown. Right. Um, but what I can tell you is that our 56 Joint Terrorism Task Forces are working their tails off to make sure that they suss out and identify potential terrorist suspects, whether they're on the watch list or not. You think that number, that increased number, uh, increases the threat to the American citizens? I think any time you have a, a group of people in the United States that we don't know nearly enough about, uh, that is a source of, of concern for us from a perspective on our, in our lane of protecting Americans here. So wording it maybe another way, if it were lower, if that number were lower and the border wasn't as open as it is, and we'd be safer. I think greater fidelity about who's coming in this country and how they're getting in uh, is essential to yeah. making sure we protect Americans from, from all sorts of threats, including a potential terrorist attack. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Director Ray, since uh, taking office, we've had, uh, with the policies that are implemented at the border, 6.5 million southwest border encounters and a total of 7.8 million nationwide. Does it concern the FBI that the policies of this administration and the Department of Homeland Security are allowing this unprecedented number of unknown and unvetted people into the country? I know it's a rewording of the previous question, but go ahead and answer. Well, again, I want to stay in my lane. Um, when it comes to physical security, border security, uh, I want to defer to Department of Homeland Security on that. But that, but I, that, that increased number is, is increasing your, the challenge before but, you in the FBI, right? But, but certainly I can tell you that we have seen uh, an increase in the number of so-called KSTs attempting to cross uh, in the last five years. Uh, and we are concerned not just about the people who are watch listed, well, why do but you about those who, who could have gotten in some other way uh, and who, uh, about whom you may not have sufficient information at the time they came in to identify them as a source of Those individuals, that, that, that watch list that we talk about, uh, why do you think in four years before this there were only 11 and suddenly there are uh, 294 in the past few years? Why do you think that's so? I can't. I can't really speak to you know to to that issue. It's not not in my lane. I can tell you that the threats that come from the other side of the border uh, are very much consuming all 56 of our field offices, not just in the border 
states. Uh, that's why I made the point. For sure, I, I, about I agree. The, yeah. what, if I heard you correctly, what you just said is not every state in the country is a border state now. Is that what you just said? Well, I didn't. I mean, the threats to every state. that way, but the threats that come from the other side of the border are affecting every state. Absolutely, one hundred percent. We ask uh, the governor of Massachusetts; she's uh, screaming at the top of her lungs about the situation at the southwest border. Um, your boss, uh, the attorney general, came in and and said to us uh, that it was very clear the cartel strategy was to take advantage of the current policies, overwhelm the crossing sites, and then use the you know, Border Patrol agents being overwhelmed by that group to then bypass. Um, do, you, do you have any reason to disagree with him that that's the cartel strategy? I, I, I wouldn't have any reason to disagree with the Attorney General. Um, do you find it interesting that with it, two months after that, Secretary Mayorkas came in and said he was unaware of that cartel strategy? Do you find that interesting? I... I I, I'm not familiar with Secretary Mayor. That, that testimony. Yeah, he came in to us and told us that he was totally unaware of that testimony, that that was the cartel strategy, despite uh, your boss in the Senate clearly recognizing that it is. Um, let me just say this in the few seconds I have left. I'd like to ask each of you to take back to the people who work for you that despite our political differences on this dais, we deeply appreciate the men and women who are manning their posts and doing the best they can for this country. As someone who went down range uh, and uh, you know was in a helicopter that had bullet holes ripping through the bottom, you know bullets ripping through the bottom of it, I understand uh, the courage that it takes to do the jobs that you and your people do. And so I want to make sure I ask each of you, despite our political differences, to take this message back. We are deeply appreciative of the men and women who man their posts for this country's safety. With that, I yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much. Uh, let me paraphrase what the chairman just said. While we praise our men and women, when the opportunity comes to put the money where the praises are, Democrats on this committee have consistently supported the funding of DHS's budget. We've consistently funded uh, the FBI's budget and our intelligence gathering agencies, because we understand that those men and women who put their lives on the line deserve all the resources. Now, uh, taken from that, uh, we've not, on the Democratic side, ever voted against one of your budgets. We understand it. We can differ on the policy, but we don't differ on the fact that you need the investment. There are some members of this committee who've even advocated defunding the FBI. Now, I can't in my wildest dreams imagine if we had an impotent FBI where that would put us. Director Ray, if those advocates who wanted to defund the FBI uh, in this country, can you give us a snapshot of what that defunding would mean for the security of the homeland? Well, I mean, the FBI in the last year, for example, has arrested over 18,000 violent criminals. That's about 50 per day. So defunding the FBI would mean that many more violent criminals out on the streets terrorizing neighborhoods. We have, as I said in my opening statement, about 2,000 active investigations into Chinese economic espionage. Uh, restricting our funding would be a gift to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the FBI has about 380 uh, investigations into cartel leadership. Um, it, lifting our funding means more power to the cartels. Uh, the FBI has investigations into 100 different ransomware variants. Um, that's, and each one of those has scores of victims. Uh, limiting our funding means more, uh, more hacks, more intrusions, more damage to critical infrastructure. China alone has uh, the biggest hacking program in the world by far. Uh, they're not slowing down. They're not restricting their funding. So uh, from our perspective, it's not just about the, the hardworking career professionals of the FBI and their families and their kids that would be affected. More importantly, it's state and local law enforcement who are counting on us more and more. And more importantly than that, the American people that we're trying to protect from gangs, the Chinese, 
uh, government, cyber hackers, mm -hmm. cartels, child predators, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Abizade, can you say what uh, resource deficit would mean for your agency? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, the National Counterterrorism Center has a couple of important missions. We're the primary center for the United States government to analyze and assess the foreign terrorist threat. We work on screening and vetting of individuals that are trying to enter the country. We support DHS and FBI in that mission with the intelligence database of known and suspected terrorists. Um, we do a lot of work across state, local, tribal, territorial, and federal authorities to do the kind of information sharing that's absolutely essential, especially in a dynamic threat environment like we have today, to keep everyone informed and armed with the information they need to protect against exactly the kinds of threats that we've outlined here for you today. So decreased funding for the National Counterterrorism Center, decreased funding for any piece of the overall CT architecture that works collaboratively together has an impact on our ability to stay ready against the, the terrorist threat. Thank you. Secretary Mayorkas, there's a supplemental uh, proposal uh, being put forth by the administration. Can you share with us what that means for DHS? Uh, Ranking Member Thompson, uh, that supplemental is dedicated to our critical mission of securing our border and also uh, battling uh, the scourge of fentanyl. Those funds are needed for personnel, technology, facilities, and additional support resources, critically needed to advance our mission. We are under-resourced and have been perennially. Thank you very much. I yield back. <clears throat> the gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Mr. McCall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, let me say uh, my thanks to all three of you, uh, your employees who work so hard to protect this country, um, having served at the Department of Justice for many years and the Chief of Counterterrorism and National Security. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, you don't hear that very often these days. And also, I agree with you, uh, Director, that uh, 702 FISA is a critical element to securing and protecting Americans. And I will fight very hard to get that reauthorized. Uh, moving forward, um, Director Ray, we've had over about 7.5 million encounters at the southern border. Um, we've had 7,000 special interest aliens. We've had 200, nearly 200 on the terror watch list. When I chaired this committee, that was the first, and when I got the briefings, first question I ever asked was, how many SIAs, how many on the terror watch list? If I would, 200 is alarming to me. Does that give you concern? Certainly, I, the numbers give us concern. Uh, I think it's important, though, in some ways, um, to realize that it's numbers alone don't even really tell the problem. And we've all seen how much damage just a small number uh, of foreign terrorists could cause. I mean, it, sometimes people, as crazy as it sounds, tend to forget that it was 19 people who killed 3,000 people. That was the next point I was gonna make. It only took 19 to create 9-11. And um, that's alarming. I just got back from Israel. I saw the Hamas videos, it is very disturbing. I know you've testified previously that Hamas could either inspire attacks or maybe get into the country. The problem is we don't know who these 200 people are. And to your point, how many others got in that we don't even know about? Why won't either you or the secretary provide us with the full, complete, accurate information as I used to get when I was chair of this committee who are these 200 individuals? Who are they? Is Hamas on the list? We know the SIAs include countries like Iran, Lebanon, and Iraq. That gives me great pause. We provide that to this committee. Well, we will certainly continue to engage with the committee uh, in closed session with, with numbers and information. 
Um, as you know uh, from your past experience with this issue, for one thing, the numbers themselves change literally moment to moment. And so it's important for us to be careful to be accurate and timely with with the information we've got. But then and, I think- You know, and it could be in a classified setting. That's, that's how they used to do it when I was chair of this committee. I don't have that information. My governor of the state of Texas who has to deal with this problem on a daily basis cannot get this information. You know, I understand before 9-11 we had walls up, you know, sharing information, connecting the dots, but this is, you know, 2023. I mean, it seems to me we should be able to share that information. Well, I, I, I'm happy to have my staff follow up. I know we've had a lot of engagements with uh, the Hill over, uh, uh, over different numbers and populations of individuals. And so I guess I'd have to circle back to figure out exactly what has I, I would like, as, a, as a, an American and a Texan, I, I'd kind of like to know personally. And, and, and uh, Mr. Secretary, you know, um, there was an Austin SWAT officer killed in my hometown who was on the terror watch list. A SWAT officer murdered by someone on the terror watch list. His, and the family involved was Mohammed Nasser. Do you have any information about this? Um, Mr. Chairman, we'd be pleased to provide you with whatever information we have in the- Please do. And, and let me just say, 18 U.S.C. Section 2A states, whoever commits an offense against the United States or aids and abets, counsels, command, induces, or procures its commission is punishable as the principal. Human trafficking. A criminal enterprise in this country now with people with no legal status, an entire population seven times over to be killed by fentanyls, 12 billion total, 300,000 people dead due to fentanyls. Sir, I would argue that you've been aiding and abetting the, the deaths and the criminal enterprise that has occurred in this nation. I see my time. Well, I got 15 seconds. Uh, no, no, you don't. Oh, I'm 15 <laughs> seconds you're, you're over. over. <laughs> I'd, still, I'd still like to go on, but I think I've made my point. It's going the other way. <laughs> the gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, you know, just for in informational purposes, you know, there are, there are Americans on a terror watch list as well. So, um, you know, I would suggest we take in all the information uh, with respect to that. Um, I want to thank the witnesses for making themselves available today. Um, Director Ray, in 2021, more than 26,000 Americans lost their lives by homicide, close to 21,000 of which were um, committed with a firearm. Uh, the same year, 61 of 73 law enforcement officers who died from um, felonious assault were killed by firearms. While we're seeing more uh, <clears throat> states specifically re reliably, uh, reliably Republican voting states adopt more permissive gun laws, we're also seeing a uh, rise in anti-government and violent extremists targeting law enforcement. <laughs> How dangerous is it to be in law enforcement right now under these circumstances? And how um, do we rectify the threat uh, to the men and women of law enforcement? Well, certainly uh, this is a dangerous time for law enforcement. Um, as you mentioned, 2021 was the deadliest year uh, for law enforcement, uh, I think since 9-11. Um, and this year, the pace is awfully close to what 2021 is. Um, and I say that with a level of personal familiarity with it. In 2021, we had uh, two of our agents uh, killed in Florida, uh, attempting to execute a, a search related to a child exploitation case and a task force officer of ours in Indiana gunned down right outside of our offices. 
Uh, and every time, one of the things I decided I was going to do when I took this job now six and a half years ago was every time an officer is shot and killed in the line of duty anywhere in the country, uh, I call the chief or the sheriff myself and talk to him and express my condolences on behalf of the FBI. I have a little write-up on the family, a photo of the fallen officer, um, and I've made something like 350 of those calls. Um, and, you know, being in law enforcement is dangerous enough. What it shouldn't be is wearing a badge making you a target. And we're seeing way too much of that in today's America. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you explain why 60% of guns used in, in violent crimes in New Jersey, the state I represent and have lived in all my life, come from Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida? What do, the, what do those states have in common that make them uh, dangerous exporters of uh, criminal firearms? I'm not sure I could speak to the specific uh, circumstances of each of those states. Uh, certainly, um, straw purchases um, and, and gun trafficking is, uh, is a, an ingredient that drives the violent crime uh, problem that we have in this country. It's one of many things that drives that problem. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield. Um, the final minute of my time to Mr. Goldman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I, I asked to uh, yield just to respond to uh, something that my, my distinguished colleague from Texas just said, uh, who I know has served, uh, for, served for a long time as a federal prosecutor, as have I, and as has Secretary Mayorkas. I think it's incredibly dangerous to accuse Secretary Mayorkas of aiding and abetting crimes. As you well know, you need to have the intent to do that. And uh, it is clear that whether you disagree or not with Secretary Mayorkas's approach to dealing with the border, that to accuse him of aiding and abetting crime is very serious and is, I think, uh, unwarranted in this situation. Well, the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, Look, I live in a border state, you don't. And I've dealt with this issue for 25 years. I've never seen it this bad. It's his dereliction of duty that has created this problem in the United States. Seven million people, how are we gonna deal with that? No legal status, human trafficking, fentanyls. Look, I, 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 we will disagree on this one, but I have to say that the change of policy has created this problem, and he knows better. He was a U.S. attorney in Los Angeles, like you were. He knows better. Will you yield for one second? I yield back. Well, actually, actually, the time has expired, so if someone else wants to yield to these gentlemen, you certainly may do that. But the time has expired, and we'd like to continue on so that everyone gets their opportunity. Um, but I do appreciate the dialogue. I believe now we are with Mr. Higgins, the gentleman from Louisiana. Sir, you're recognized for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, ultimately, as we consider threats to the homeland in our annual hearing on that topic with, with leading members of the executive branch before us, it's important to reflect upon the simple fact that ultimately Americans are quite capable of defending our own soil, our own cultures and communities against foreign invasion or against armed oppression from within. However, it's far more threatening to our republic if our own government facilitates criminal invasion and it is incre incredibly threatening to our citizenry if our government's highest levels of law enforcement coordinate organized campaigns of weaponized oppression, op oppression, harassment, investigation, arrest and prosecution, and imprisonment of free Americans. That 
Mr. Chairman, is the primary threat our homeland indeed faces today. Secretary Mayorkas, I've noted you as a worthy adversary, sir, for two and a half years, but my issue is not with you today. I'm done with you. I've completed my investigative work. It's quite extensive. I've filed my articles of impeachment against you, and I've, I've provided my investigative work to the appropriate committee. So let me just say that my articles have been filed, and my time with you is done. Director Ray. Last year, you might recall, sir, our exchange regarding the FBI's involvement on January 6th and prior. I'm happy to jog your memory to quote, according to the record, I ask you, did you have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters positioned inside the Capitol on January 6th prior to the doors being opened? You responded, I quote, again, I have to be very careful of what I say to which I said, it should be a no. Can you not tell the American people, no, we did not have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters positioned inside the Capitol on January 6th. A year has passed. We sit here again a year later, we the people still do not have a definitive answer from you or anyone else in the Biden administration regarding the FBI presence and participation in the months leading up to the November election and in the weeks and days prior to January 6th and on January 6th here in D.C. We can't get a straight answer, it, although we have a tremendous amount of evidence harvested and reviewed over the course of the last year, which you will see in September Stephen D'Artano, formerly in charge of the FBI's field office in Washington, D.C., testified to the House Judiciary Committee that he was aware the FBI informants would attend the Stop the Steal rally thrown on January 6th. You confirmed that the FBI had confidential human sources at the Stop the Steal rally on January 6th here in D.C., sir? Congressman, as we've discussed before, I'm not going to get into where we have or have not used confidential human sources. But what okay, I can we'll tell move you, on. you asked for a definitive answer. We'll move answer. on. It's my time. If, if, you said no. You're not going to answer. That's if, cool. We're watching. Mr. Chairman, may you're, I answer you're, the question? A moment. A moment will come. This is my time. Earlier this year, an FBI informant who is reported to have, quote, his quote, under oath, marched to the U.S. Capitol with fellow Proud Boys members on January the 6th, close quote. He said he was communicating with his FBI handler while people were entering the U.S. Capitol. Can you confirm that the FBI had that sort of engagement with your own agents embedded within the crowd on January 6th? If you are asking whether the violence at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources and or agents, the answer is emphatically You're saying not. no? No. You're saying not no? Not okay. violence orchestrated Let's by FBI on. sources or agents. Are you familiar with, with, you know what a ghost vehicle is? Director, director of the FBI certainly should. You know what a ghost bus is? A ghost bus? Ghost bus. I'm not sure I've used that term before. Okay. Well, it's pretty common in, in law enforcement. It's a, it's a vehicle that's, that's used for secret purposes. It's painted over. These two buses in the middle here, they were the first to arrive at Union Station on January 6th, 0500. I have all this evidence. I'm showing you a tip of this iceberg. Mr. Chairman. These two buses Mr. are Chairman. painted completely white. Point of order. Point of order, sure. Just run over the time. I understand, but you'll recall that Ms. Jackson Lee's been allowed to go two minutes before. I've been very fair in letting people finish their questioning throughout my tenure as chairman, and I'll continue to be fair on that regard. But I will make a note to the members, if you could stay as close within your time as possible, we have a lot of people that want to ask these gentlemen questions. So with that, the gentleman yields. 
but uh, your, your point, I've been very fair in this, Mr. Ivey, with everybody on this side of the aisle just as much. I don't think I side. accuse you of being unfair, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Uh, you're, you're making a point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now recognize... Now recognize, Mr. May Gray. I close this, this statement, uh, Mr. No, Mr. Chairman? No, I, I think I think your time is expired, Mr. I Chairman. note that that other members across the aisle have been been granted time, and I object well, to my to my question being, well, being closed. This is a very significant hearing, Mr. Chairman, and these buses are nefarious in nature and were filled with FBI informants dressed as Trump supporters. You, and you, deployed onto our capital on January 6th. Yeah. You made, your you day made is your, coming, you made Mr. Your Ray. Point, Mr. Uh, Higgins. I now recognize Mr. Correa of California for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, I don't, you're the chairman. The, but. The, the gentleman could yield to you, Mr. Ranking Member, if he wants. Uh, you've been recognized. Oh, yield to you. Yeah. Okay. Just the Ranking Member. The rules of the committee says that once the chair calls the time, it's done. So, I mean, yep, yep. those are the rules of the committee. Well, thank, thanks for pointing that out, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, I think he yields to you, Mr. Correa. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for holding this hearing. And I especially want to thank the witnesses today in front of us, uh, Mr. Mayorkas, Mr. Ray, and, and Ms. Abizid. You've got a difficult task in this country today. The title of this committee is Worldwide Threats of the Homeland Security. You know, first of all, you've got the challenge of finding a needle in a haystack. Domestic terrorism. I've got a chart here from the ADL that shows the number of incidences, national level. You've got to play defense here in the U.S. as well as defense overseas. And I agree with my colleague, Mr. Mike McCall, that things have never been so bad. We're right, we're coming out of COVID right now. We've got countries, essentially failed economies, failed democracies around the world, worldwide refugee movement. And on top of that, I understand, Mr. Ray, that you essentially declared a possible heightened state of alert for the country, is that correct? Something of the sort that we just gotta watch the things that are going on right now? Uh, I've testified, and I feel uh, very strongly that we are in a heightened threat environment. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. We've got, you know, two wars going on at least, areas of conflict around the world. And I'm here really to ask, how can we help you do your job better? I'm not going to be here to ask for an impeachment or hold you accountable. I'm here to make sure that you're able to hold the line 100%. We can't afford to have another Uvalde in our country. We can't afford to have another 911. So I'm here really to listen to what it is, what resources do you need to do your job? And I'm gonna start out with you know, Mr. Mayorkas. Do you need more or less analysts? You know, this is a big job. How do you find a needle in a haystack? Do you need more analysts or less at the Homeland Security? Can that help? Congressman, um, we have submitted a request for supplemental funding. We need additional personnel, resources for, to include facilities, and technology, uh, the men and women. Of and the we Department. need technology, sir. We need good intel. We need to make sure that we're able to work with our allies, our law enforcement, state, local, federal coordination. That's why Homeland Security was created because of the silos that existed before 911. Coordinate good intel to make sure you're able to do your job. CBP-1, do you get information off of that? Do you let people just into the country or do you take their information? Do you take, what kind of data do you require for CBP to work? Congressman, CBP-1 is a process that we employ that enables us to screen and vet individuals before they arrive at the border to enable us to make a determination whether or not they should be allowed. Do you ask for biometric information? Do you, what is it exactly that you collect there to make sure that the folks that are applying are essentially vetted? Congressman, we uh, confirm identity and we screen and vet them to make sure that they do not pose either a public safety threat or a threat to our national security. Thank you. 
Director Ray, what is it that we can do as Congress to help you make sure that do you, you do your job better? Make sure that you 100% nobody scores on us. Well, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. Certainly the uh, budget request that we've submitted, uh, both in the 24 budget itself, but also the supplemental, are all things we desperately need. Second, reauthorize 702 uh, in a form where we can actually use it to protect Americans here from foreign threats. Uh, third, uh, Secretary Mayorkas highlighted, which I think uh, can't be highlighted enough, the need to reauthorize the counter UAS authority, which is going to expire at the end of this week uh, if something isn't done. Uh, and that is authority that if it's gone, no one, not DHS, not FBI, no one here can protect Americans from that threat. So those are a few of the things uh, that would be very important uh, from the FBI's perspective. And let me say that uh, I appreciate the three of you being here today because um, we need to make sure that the public out there on Main Street understands the good work you're doing. You may be controversial, but that's part of the democratic system, but you're doing a good job protecting our families back home. And I just wanna make sure people understand that we need to work as a team to make sure the job gets done. Ma'am, any thoughts on what resources you need to do your job. I would associate myself with my colleagues' comments here. FISA 702 authority is absolutely essential for the counterterrorism mission. And to your point about working as a team, the counterterrorism architecture that we've built across the intelligence community, law enforcement community, defense, diplomatic, and homeland security professional community needs to be sustained. And sustaining that at the levels we requested it would be incredibly helpful. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I yield. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the uh, vice chair of the committee, uh, the gentleman from Mississippi, uh, Mr. Guest, for five uh, minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to all our panelists, uh, thank you for being here today, uh, particularly in the threat environment that we face. Uh, Director Ray, you cite in your report that the threats we face as a nation have never been greater, uh, and I agree completely with that. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, you also talk about the threats in your report where you say terrorist threats in the United States remained heightened. Hamas attacks on Israel along with other events have sharpened the focus of potential attacks. And you go on later to say the increased prospects for violence, uh, and you talk about the increased prospects for violence uh, in the United States. Uh, and so at a time in which we face uh, increased threats domestically, uh, where we see internationally uh, uh, events continue to seem to spiral out of control. Uh, I want to talk uh, specifically uh, about the events that are transpiring along our southwest border. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary uh, Mayorkas, I have behind me a, a chart that has the encounters of CBP. Uh, this was taken off of the CBP website. Uh, and uh, just kind of want to walk through some of the information uh, contained there. Um, based upon the uh, research that I've done, it appears uh, since uh, the president took office, since you became uh, the chairman of Homeland Security, that there's been roughly 7.4 million encounters along our southwest border. Uh, if you were to put all those people in one geographic area, uh, that would uh, represent the seventh largest state in the United States uh, between Arizona uh, and Tennessee. Um, we see that uh, the last uh, month uh, prior to you taking office that there were 95,000 encounters along the southwest border. We see that the numbers reported here by your department, uh, September of uh, 23, the last reporting numbers, show that that number has spiked now to 341%. Uh, an increase of almost 250%. We know that as part of the problem, the president appointed the vice president to be the border czar uh, to help try to uh, stop the flow of illegal immigration from Mexico and Central America. Uh, that appointment was made in March of 21. Uh, in March of 21, the end of the month, there was reported 192 encounters. Uh, now we know again the number of encounters are over 341,000. Uh, and so under her watch as border czar, we see that the increase is 75%. And so the numbers have grown exponentially under your and the vice president's leadership. Uh, my, one of my questions to you is, do you look at the daily encounter numbers that are put out by your department? Is that something, a statistic that you look at on a regular basis? 
Vice Chairman Guest, um, uh, it is, in fact, and the numbers about which you speak are reflective not only of a challenge at our southwest border, but rather a challenge of migration throughout our entire hemisphere. And, and, and I, I understand that. And so you, you, you do look at the numbers. Uh, you do look at the, da the daily reporting numbers. Uh, and I uh, want to rep uh, harken back to an interview in 2019. Uh, at that time with current, uh, excuse me, former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, uh, during the Trump administration, as we were seeing 4,000 immigrants a day coming across the border. Uh, at that time, the former uh, Director of Homeland Security, uh, in an interview with MSNBC, said that, and he said, my staff would tell you that if the number of daily apprehensions was under 1,000 the day before, that was a relative good number. And if it was above 1,000, it was a relative bad number, and I was going to be in a bad mood that day. He also went on to say on Thursday, and again, this was in March of 2019 when Donald Trump was president, there were 4,000 apprehensions. I know that if 1,000 overwhelms the system, I can't begin to imagine what 4,000 a day truly looks like. We are in a crisis. And so my question to you, if Secretary Johnson said 1,000 immigrants a day when he was in the position that you sent, if that was a bad day and that 4,000 a day was a crisis, what is a bad day for you, Secretary Mayorkas? Because we see now that the numbers have exploded. They're no longer 1,000 a day. They're not even 4,000 a day when this article was written. They're over 11,000 a day. And so in the last 20 seconds, what number to you represents a bad day when we see the number of apprehensions um, increase dramatically? So I'll give you the remainder of my time to answer the question, and I'll yield back. Vice Chairman uh, Guest, uh, we do not minimize the significance of the challenge at the southwest border, uh, and we are intensely focused on it. Is there a number? Would you like to give a number? I asked for a number. That was my question. What, what number to you represents a bad day? And are you refusing to answer the question? Vice Chairman uh, Guest, uh, as I said, we do not minimize the significance <clears throat> of the challenge at the southwest border. That, that wasn't my question, Mr. Mayorkas. My, I, I ask a simple question. Give me a number. And you're filibustering, and you're refusing to answer the question. What is that number? I, I have answered your question. No, me. you haven't, Mr. Mayorkas. You've not answered the question. I can do hand signals at this <laughs> point, right? Mr. Ivey, if you let him answer the question, or maybe if you would like to answer for him, because clearly he does not intend to answer my question. I, I think it's, you know, you Is it not a fair question? I'm just saying you're over your time, that's all. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't need any more points about over the time, okay? As I just sent to you, I think it was just last week I let Mr. Correa vote after we had gaveled out. I am gracious here, and I'll be gracious to both sides of the aisle. And Mr. Chairman, so, and I, I would don't ask want you, any more interruptions about time being expired, please. Mr. Thank Mr. Chairman, you. I would ask you, you to direct the witness to answer the question. Do you have a number? I, I have answered it to the best it, of my ability, Mr. Chairman. It, Clearly. Um, I now recognize well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. If, Carter. Mr. Chairman, if I might. Point of order? And I, I'm just asking, um, is, are you basically suspending that rule or what's... what's Look, I, I have since the beginning, and this is the last time I'm going to answer this question today, Mr. Ivey, allowed people to continue a, a question train of thought that extends <laughs> outside their time. I've done that on both sides of the aisle. And I am not going to uh, articulate or waste any more of these gentlemen and this gentlelady's time defining <clears throat> the policy as I've executed it since the beginning of my chairmanship. Well, I think now let, the next person this, we're recognizing. You are not recognized, Mr. Ivey. Well, you I'm are not sorry, recognized. but if I, you are not recognized, you're you're not oh, following the rules point, that we've point voted of order, on and this, accepted. The ranking member is recognized, uh, Mr. Chairman. We adopted a set of rules. And I, I try not okay. to get involved. Yep. I, I have to Go explain ahead. my you, point of order. Now. Go ahead. And the rules clearly specify everything that's being raised. I have and never I, once, I, Mr. Ranking I, I Member, not, heard. I have not completed. Finish your thought. Thank you. So I'm saying that uh, we adopted the rules on how we conduct business. And any time a member raises the question, it's consistent. <laughs> with the rules. Now, uh, if that becomes a problem, then I think we have to modify our rules because that's how we operate. That's what Congresses are required 
to do. That's what committees are required to do. And for people to ignore the rules uh, is inconsistent with the rule. So I'm just saying to you, follow the rules that we adopt. Yeah, we're going to continue the policy as I have been doing it since I've been the chairman. Okay, if you're in the midst of a thought, we're going to let you go past your time. And, and number two, uh, I haven't heard anyone raise an issue on the left when I've allowed people on the left to go over time. Not once, Mr. Ivey, have you said when one of your members has gone over five minutes, the person's time is up. Fascinating to me that you're only doing it when it's on this side of the aisle. If, if I might have a chance Please. to be heard. Yes. All I'm saying is that the, under the rules, we have a right to raise the point of order when somebody goes over the time. You've, you've used your discretion to bring additional questioning if, if you want to, but to say I can never raise a point of order that's consistent with the rules doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's, it's just a clear violation of the rules that were adopted. And by the way, the rules were adopted, I don't think they were adopted unanimously. There was a Republican decision to adopt these rules. So but, these are but, your but, rules. No doubt about it. But the point I'm making is, is it's, it's intriguing to me that we're consuming this time over this issue while I've never once heard you raise the issue when I've allowed Ms. Jackson Lee to go two I, I, minutes I've, over. I've, I've never objected. But today it's an issue in the midst of a very important hearing. <clears throat> Anybody can raise a point of order. You're, you're, on absolutely, time when they correct. Want to. I, you're absolutely correct. I'm not. I'm not blocking you? anyone from doing that. But I, I think I have the right. And I, you do. I you request do. the right to yeah. preserve that to raise the point of order when there's an obvious. It's an reason. excellent point. Now, can we move on? Thank as you. As long as you give me, uh, the Mr. Bishop, or no, Mr. Carter, the ranking member of the subcommittee on emergency management, the gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to the. Thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. I'm heartbroken by the innocent lives that have been lost of civilians being tar and civilians being targeted by hateful terrorist groups like Hamas. This is outrageous and inevitably leads to tragic consequences. Condemning these atrocities and protecting innocent lives at all costs is pivotal. Our discussion on worldwide threats is important for the American people so we can further address such issues void of partisan brinkmanship. We all must do better. Director Ray, our, nation, our nation's HBCUs produce some of the brightest who enter our ever-growing workforce. Repeated threats to these institutions have caused widespread disruption on campuses by shutting down classes and campus activity. Mr. Ray, could you please briefly update us on the FBI's activity uh, and things that you're actively doing to monitor and combat such events in the future. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. Certainly the threats that we saw against HBCUs um, were appalling, and uh, there's absolutely no excuse for putting campuses, students, faculty, staff, in a position where they can't uh, go about their, uh, their lives at, at school uh, in fear. Uh, and so we have actively been investigating the threats as they've come in. As you know, there was an arrest related to some of the threats involved, uh, involved a juvenile uh, who was responsible for a number of the threats. I think more importantly, we've doubled down on our engagement with HBCUs. I've personally engaged with a, a number of HBCU law enforcement uh, heads. Uh, we have a, a, an increased partnership with campus law enforcement uh, over the last two years, uh, that's, you know, including in this recent uh, threat environment, we're very careful to include campus law enforcement and all of our law enforcement partner calls. We have campus liaison uh, uh, officers, in effect, appointed in each one of our field offices to uh, focus specifically on engagement with, uh, with academia. Uh, so that's a big part of it. It's not just the investigations uh, and the analysis, but also the outreach how, how has that been ramped up with the recent um, hate speak for Muslims and um, Jewish brothers and sisters and uh, Palestinians? We see this overboiling um, because of what's happening in the Middle East, um, spreading and boiling into the college campus um, uh, environment as well as just our general communities. We know that Hamas is, uh, is the true threat um, but because of these risks, we're seeing this bleed over into a level of hatred for innocent people who have nothing to do with Hamas. 
Well, certainly we're in an environment where the, uh, the number of tips and threats that are being reported to us have gone up significantly uh, since October 7th. We were already, as I testified earlier, already in an elevated threat environment even before October 7th, and it's gone to a whole nother level since October 7th. Uh, the biggest chunk uh, of the threats that have been uh, reported into us uh, by a good margin are threats to the Jewish community, uh, synagogues, uh, Jewish prominent officials, uh, things like that. Uh, we also have a, a large number of tips and leads related specifically to Hamas and radicalization and recruitment. Uh, we do also have some threats uh, to Muslim Americans uh, that have also been called in. Uh, and so we are urgently running down every tip and lead we get and trying to mitigate them and engaging. I think the thing that distinguishes the post-October 7th environment even more than the pre-October 7th environment. One of the things that distinguishes it is how- Director, I don't want to cut you off. You've yeah. got an important job. We appreciate the hard work Thanks. that you and you and the men and women of your department do. Um, very quickly, Secretary Mayorkas, the Conrad Weapons Mass Destruction um, CWMD office will sunset. You acknowledge this in your opening remarks. If Congress does not act, I understand that there are a few vehicles which you're working on to ensure uh, that C, WMD continues to operate. As you know, uh, last night we passed temporary measure in the CR that will extend uh, the, the, the sunset through February of 2024. Um, if this is not made permanent, if we're not able to move forward with a permanent measure, how does that impact your ability to protect American cities and to protect our country? Uh, Congressman, uh, thank you very much. It um, is a incredible detriment to our ability to secure the American people. Just in the last two days, a local law enforcement officer equipped with some of the um, equip equipment that we provide to detect a radiological nuclear material, uh, in fact, was wearing a device that detected um, an abandoned material in a very unsafe location that could have caused a tremendous amount of harm to people in the surrounding community. This is a vital authority that we absolutely need. Thank you. My time is expired. Thank Gentlemen, you know, there's a point of uh, order in uh, informing the committee. Votes have been called. We're going to do two more members, uh, Mr. Bishop and then Mr. Swalwell. We'll recess and we'll reconvene 10 minutes after the final vote. Uh, I now recognize uh, the chairman of the Oversight Subcommittee, Mr. Bishop from North Carolina, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I listen to the, your opening statements, uh, I'm, I'm floored by the fact that I perceive a dramatic shift in the positions of each of you from the hearing that you, from the testimony that you gave and the way you answered questions just last November. Director Abizade, I want to begin with you. Last time I asked you this, Director Abizade, does the National Counterterrorism Center assess a significant threat from the historic level of uncontrolled crossing at the southern border? And your answer was, we don't, actually. Um, the the uh, Judiciary Committee has released a document that says there are confirmed 1.7 million gotaways. Maybe one of you has a better number than that. Millions have been processed and released to the extent that the mayor of New York, Aaron, Eric Adams, says that New York City is being destroyed. All of you are aware of those things. Director Abizé, do you continue to maintain that there is no material risk of organized terrorism from this massive infiltration, both of people minimally encountered and almost two million people neither encountered or vetted whatsoever? I appreciate the question, and we absolutely recognize the kind of vulnerabilities that are associated with border security across all of our ports of entry, across Southwest border and, and otherwise. But, but I would maintain, and I talk to my analysts about this on a regular basis, that as we look at the global terrorism environment, as we look at foreign terrorist organizations' intentions to try and seed operatives into the United States, 
We don't have indications that are credible or corroborated that those terrorist organizations are trying to do that at this time. You are aware, are you not, ma'am? You remember, I made this comment the last time. The 9-11 Commission report talked about the system blinking red. There were obvious risks. Director Ray sat next to you just a few minutes ago, and you've changed your tenor uh, to Dr. Director Ray, and you said that uh, you observed that it took only 20 to take down the World Trade Center. So among a million seven coming in, not interdicted by, um, by the federal government or any government, why is that not an obvious risk to you that we could have organized terrorism? How many cells no, could you sir, create of 20 people sir, that could do may, something I'd like, like that? Sir, if I may, I'd like to clarify, we absolutely recognize the risk. In fact, if you look at the kind of counterterrorism enterprise that we've built that's focused on collecting overseas, that's focused on border security, that's focused on screening, vetting, watch listing individuals and terrorist identities, it's absolutely a risk that we understand and a vulnerability that we work very hard over the last 20 years to shore up. So my comments relate to the intelligence about foreign terrorist plans and intentions. You've deployed and that. It, you've and deployed. it is not about, it is not a statement about what risk we think we have. We, well, that's, we that's recognize even, that's even more. Asto risk. I'll, I'll stop you and reclaim my time because you seem to be going on. That seems to me even more astonishing because you've sat in this administration almost since its beginning alongside S Secretary Mayorkas while elective policies have been pursued to allow that to happen. Uh, uncontrolled immigration processing millions of people through border patrol posts and a CBP and border patrol to overwhelm those agencies so that this unbelievably and unprecedented, historically unprecedented number of gotaways could come through. You've all given it sucker. You've all permitted it to happen and said nothing publicly about what you now acknowledge to be a material risk. And it seems to me we're going to see the manifestation of that risk. Secretary, Secretary Marcus, in your testimony, both written and oral today, you said the world has changed since Hamas's attack in October. What's changed about Hamas? Oh, uh, Hamas has been and continues to be a terrorist organization. Exactly. And so does Hezbollah. And so do all the others, including Al-Qaeda. Nothing's changed. And you have supervised elective policies that have allowed this level of flow into the United States. Isn't that true? That is not true. Oh, you haven't done it electively. You couldn't have changed anything to, to, to atten attenuate the flow. Is that your testimony? Congressman, um, our policies are directed at securing uh, the border. Can you give me a quick answer? Are your policy, could you have changed anything to attenuate the flow? Congressman, we are seeking to address the flow every single day. Boy, that's amazing. And you've continued to say that sort of thing, and I just don't, I agree with Mr. Higgins, it doesn't warrant uh, much asking. Let me ask you, Mr. Ray, we've seen now this spectacle of hundreds of thousands of people waving Palestinian flags, attacking the gates of the White House, vandalizing places. You've expended, in fact, so has Mr. Mayorkas, expended tremendous resources to stop foreign malign influence. With millions of people coming into the country unvetted, is that a foreign? Is that at all a foreign a malign influence operation in the, now operating in the United States homeland? We view it as a threat. I don't think we view it as a foreign malign influence threat, but that's just terminology. Do you know whether it is or not? In other words, do you know whether those in, those protests are in significant part uh, the process, the the product of people who've been allowed into the country, the millions illegally? We have not seen intelligence that would indicate that. I do want to. I do want to add, though, uh, Congressman, when it comes to my testimony from last year, I specifically said, and I'm looking at the transcript last year, that we had a concern from a national security perspective that we'd seen an increase in the number of KSDs attempting to cross over the past five years, and I, in fact, specifically brought up the case that we brought against an individual who brought, tried to smuggle in foreign nationals to assassinate... I'd, I'd be working hard to cover my okay. posterior, too. You did say yeah, more than the gentleman did, but you didn't come forward and say that what she said was completely wrong, and you should have. The gentleman, the gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. Swalwell, the ranking member of the Cyber Subcommittee, the gentleman from California, for his five minutes questioning. And we will recess after his uh, questioning. A longtime friend of mine who works uh, in the intelligence uh, community once told me uh, Eric, that the challenge uh, with our job is that we're only known for our failures, uh, that most Americans have no idea about the successes that we achieve on behalf 
of the American people every day. And uh, whether it's uh, fentanyl seizures at the border or a terrorist plot uh, that's disrupted, uh, most folks uh, don't know about it and aren't able to thank you for it. Uh, and when they do see uh, the work, uh, they see it in a public hearing uh, like today. So I just want to thank you. I also want to thank uh, Director Ray and Secretary Mayorkas for uh, sending to my congressional district a couple weeks ago uh, some of your staff uh, the, from the uh, special agent in charge in San Francisco to the CISA office uh, to assist us in hosting a cybersecurity summit uh, for our small business uh, community. It was very uh, effective and helpful, and I think they have a better sense of where uh, they should go. Um, Director Ray, I, I wanted to ask you about the extrajudicial killing of a Sikh leader in Canada uh, that uh, occurred outside of Gurdwara. Uh, my district has one of the largest uh, Sikh populations uh, in the United States. Uh, a, an individual, Dr. Pritpal Singh, uh, who's the founder of the American Sikh Caucus, uh, lives in Fremont, which is in my district. He has very publicly acknowledged that he was warned by the FBI about his own safety. And I just want to know uh, what the FBI is doing right now to protect individuals uh, in the Sikh community uh, from any threats uh, like to them uh, because of uh, who they worship, what they believe. So uh, without talking about any investigative work that we're doing, uh, other than to note that part of what you're describing uh, involves uh, an, an increase in violence and threats against people uh, for, their, uh, for their views, for their beliefs, for example, the transnational repression that we talk about so much uh, is certainly a variation of that. And we've seen that from the Chinese and the Iranians, for example. Um, but when it comes to the Sikh community here, uh, we do have uh, quite a number of efforts to engage in outreach, to raise awareness about who to call, what to be on the lookout for, um, uh, to understand what a hate crime is, for example, uh, because one of the things we know about hate crimes is whether they're against Sikhs or anybody else, is they're chronically underreported, and part of that is for people to understand what a hate crime looks like uh, so they know when to reach out to law enforcement. So we've tried to kind of raise awareness, and it kind of ties into your broader point about uh, the intelligence community uh, in terms of prevention, quietly preventing things. You know, our vision statement is ahead of the threat, and if we are successful in being ahead of the threat, of course, the threat doesn't end up coming to fruition. Um, it's a little bit like being the holder for a place kicker. Uh, you can distinguish yourself if the kick goes smoothly, but it's, uh, it's hard not to right. uh, be noticed uh, if the kick doesn't go well. At the end of the year, uh, Section 702 uh, director expires. And this is a part of the law that allows the intelligence community and law enforcement to investigate and stop uh, threats, credible threats to the United States, to our homeland, to our people from abroad. Could you conceive a greater case of self-sabotage uh, to create a vulnerability to the United States than letting Section 702 uh, lapse uh, at the end of the year? I think letting 702 lapse would be uh, short-sighted at best and dangerous in the extreme at worst. Uh, to be clear, 702 is what allows us to get eyes on foreign threats overseas that pose national security threats to people here in the homeland. Uh, and as somebody who was in FBI headquarters on 9-11 mm. and spent an awful lot of my time in the Bush administration in the years after that engaging with the victims and the families uh, of the 9-11 attacks, we should never be in a position where we can't say we did everything constitutionally and legally in our power to see the threats when they're coming. And that's what 702 enables us to do. And especially, especially in this heightened threat environment with, uh, as I said in my opening statement, a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations calling for attacks against us. The idea that we would deliberately blind ourselves to information that is lawfully in our possession uh, just strikes me as crazy. And do you believe a foreign national terrorist suspect should be afforded the right to a warrant requirement? Uh, no, and I don't think there's any court that suggests otherwise. There's Thank a you. lot of people throwing around the words unconstitutional in this debate, and yet I don't think there's any court 
that has found that the way in which 702 use, is used is in any way a violation of the Fourth Amendment or the Constitution. Because these are foreign nationals overseas. Yes, correct. Thank you. Yield back. Gentlemen, Yields, we will recess until 10 minutes after the last vote, and we will text out that exact time once we have it. Thank you.